This is a production of Cornell University. Hi, everyone. Welcome again to the 2023 HEMP webinar series. Once again, your host, Luis Monserrat, I'm a second year PhD student accompanied with Tony Baracco, a Cornell alum that has been helping me organize this and put together all the digital platform along with Gemma. Lastly, I just want to remind everyone that this webinar is going to be a component of a larger project, which is the development of a educational modules that will be freely available on the Cornell website. This uh, module or each of the eight modules will have the recorded webinar, an instructional slide deck, and a set of high impact papers respected to each subject. In this case, it will be hand pest, for example. And also remind uh, to remind you and remind others that um, this webinar, as well as future and past webinars, will be available on the Cornell SIPS YouTube channel if you're interested in rewatching them or sharing them with somebody else. So, with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Katie Britt. She's a postdoctoral scholar affiliated with the University of California, Riverside, in the Department of Entomology. I do not want to extend the introduction because I'm sure that she will like most of the time to cover her content. Uh, and I just want to say that her talk is going to be on arthropod pests on high cannabinoid hemp. So without further ado, please, Dr. Britt, take it away. Thanks, Luis. Well, yeah, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to share what I've gathered so far over several years of studying insect and mite pests in hemp, or better known as arthropods. Um, before we jump in, I wanted to put my email address here. If you have questions or comments or anything to share about anything that I cover today, feel free to reach out. I always like talking about this work and I'm really happy to help if you need it in any way that I can. Um, also really briefly, there's a lot to cover, but I just wanted to tell you who I am and my experience um, in this realm of work. Um, I'm Katie. I finished or I earned my PhD in entomology from Virginia Tech just over two years ago. Um, the focus of that work was insect and mite pest management in hemp. Started that in 2017 when hemp was really, really new, wrapped up in 2021. After finishing that degree, I came out to California um, and have been doing a postdoc with UC Riverside focused on the same type of work. Um, and as Louise said, I'm affiliated with UC Riverside, but I'm not in Southern California. I'm located at an off-campus research station um, in the Central Valley, just outside of Fresno. So enough about that. Uh, I'm going to jump right in. I have so many things to cover today. Um, hopefully it, it won't go over time, but yeah, let's get started. So again, I'm covering arthropods associated with hemp. This focuses on insects and mites. Um, the bulk of what I've got to tell you about our pest species, but it's worth noting that it's not just pests, arthropods that are associated with hemp or cannabis. Um, you know, if you walk through a field with well, an outdoor field or an indoor production system, you're going to see an abundance of species. A lot of those are bad guys. Some of those are good guys. Some of those are just passing through um, as in occasional feeders or transient species. Um, sometimes they're attracted to hemp because it's there. It's an available food source. They might try to feed on it before they find that they don't like it or want to move on, or they see something in the hemp that they're attracted to, um, and they could be attracted to another species more than the crop itself. So again, it's worth noting that you're going to see a lot of insect and mite activity, but not all of it is bad. Um, but we're going to focus on some of the bad ones today. So the first and foremost that I wanna talk about is corn earworm. Um, I always say this is not an if pest, it's a when. If you're growing a crop outdoors, you're going to see this um, and your crop is likely to be damaged from it. Um, I've, I've tried to put this beginning slide on the key pest that I'm gonna discuss today. So I've got the um, common name up top along with the scientific name, where it's found, whether it's a generalist or a specialist, um, whether you can find it indoor or outdoor and the likelihood of encountering this pest um, in your operation. So this is a pest that's found pretty much everywhere. It's found outdoors, only in rare situations can it be found indoors. Um, and that's usually because it came in on some uh, harvested material. 
Um, and I say likelihood of encounter, this is pretty certain if you're producing a crop outdoors. So again, it's a key pest of hemp. Um, I think the number one pest that may differ based on the system that you're producing in, but I, I always stick by the fact that this is pretty much the number one pest of hemp. Um, this is what it looks like. It's a caterpillar. The adult stage is a moth. It's a pretty drab colored tan moth. Um, on the, the photo on the left, you can see where she's actually laying eggs in a hemp plant. And on the right has some photos of the actual eggs. They're really, really tiny. They're visible to the naked eye, but they're difficult to see just because this tiny egg can really blend in with the rest of the plant material. Um, but they are visible, like I said. Um, here's some more photos. You know, they can vary in size as they move and develop throughout the plant. They can differ in coloration as well as location throughout the plant. Um, larval coloration in particular can vary. Most of the caterpillars that you see in hemp are going to be a bright green, but again, that depends. Sometimes they can be darker in color. They can be yellow, they can be pink, black, brown, um, quite a spectrum. So they're really attracted to hemp when it begins to flower, as are most um, arthropods that we cover today. So they're attracted to and they feed from the inflorescence portion of the crop, which is the attractive portion. Uh, once the inflorescence inflorescences start to form, um, moths, female moths are active and they may begin laying eggs on the crop at this time. Um, so it can be tricky to find them sometimes because they'll nestle in plants, as you can see in the photo on the left. And in addition to chewing uh, bud structures, they can just uh, chew all throughout the plant. Sometimes they'll feed from leaves, but it's more commonly stems and bud material. Their chewing can really damage the integrity of the stem. So you see the feeding wound in the middle of this photo. Um, basically, the rest of the plant material that's attached to where this wound is, is likely going to die. So it's going to rot and create this brown coloration and just end up with rotted material that you can't really do anything with. And it's just making your, your bud material ugly and taking away some material that you would harvest. So again, these feeding injuries can lead to what we call bud rot. Um, sometimes it can come from just the stem being clipped and that plant material just straight up dying off. But I think more commonly what is happening is that this caterpillar is coming in, feeding on the plant and creating these wounds and pathogens that exist in the environment are able to get in via these feeding wounds, which ends up causing rotted material in the plant. So rot, I think, you know, it's, it's concentrated in these bud portions. It's typically more towards the top of the plant, but not always. Um, it can be present anywhere there is bud material. And like I was saying earlier, it's just really undesirable. If you're trying to harvest this to sell it as a raw material, you know, there's going to be speckled spots of rot throughout it. And it's really highly undesirable. Um, their frass, um, also known as insect poop, can also be an additional contaminant. Uh, these photos are from my time in Virginia, um, which is a more humid climate than the West where I'm at now. But, you know, pathogens are a major concern. And like I've stated, and anytime there's feeding wounds, these pathogens can get in. Um, it's just, it's gross. It's really undesirable. You don't want them anywhere near the plant really, but they're going to be there. Um, more photos where the caterpillar has just eaten and moved throughout the plant and deposited its frass along the way. It's yucky, it's gross, you really don't want to see this. Um, so what do we know about this pest and what has field research told us? Um, so this is published in an open access publication through the Journal of Integrated Pest Management. There's a screenshot of the article below if you want to access it. Um, you know, the, the photo of the trap on the right, this is an adult moth or an earworm trap. Um, this is used in other type of crop systems like soybeans and corn, where corn earworm is also a pest. You know, it'd be really great if we could use these in hemp. Um, you can definitely use these traps in hemp um, to alert you that moths are active and circulating around the field. But unfortunately, 
the number of moths that are caught in traps doesn't seem to correlate with larval abundance um, at the sites where we've conducted studies. Um, so again, pheromone traps can let you know that moths are active and potentially depositing eggs on the crop, but it's really not always a reliable predictor of larval presence in the crop. That really comes from you scouting it and knowing what's going on in your crop. As far as corn earworm management, this is going to differ based on where you're located and what typical pesticide rules are based on where you live and where you produce your crop. But something I at least want to draw your particular attention to is um, a group of insecticides that are called nucleopolyhedroviruses, the big word. Um, you could use NPV for short. Um, I've done some studies with these, particularly in Virginia, and you know it. It's not a silver bullet by any means, but it is at least an option that I think um, I want you to know about. You know, the only thing with using these products, timing is really important. You've got to target really small caterpillars. So again, this comes from scouting, knowing that the pest is in your field, you can apply an insecticide at the correct time and get greater efficacy. Um, it's only target is corn earworm, so it's safe for non-targets, unlike BT or other types of biopesticides, which may um, attack more species. So what it looks like when corn earworm larvae are infected by this virus, they kind of just look melted and kind of snotty, like hanging on the bud material of the plant. So it looks really gross, but it's a good sign and it means the insecticide is working. Um, additionally, larvae will migrate to the top portion of the plant as they die. And as they are dying, as their body breaks down, viral particles will spread throughout the field. Um, so it's, it's just letting you know that this type of insecticide exists. And I think it's um, a decent option for corn earworm management based on what we know at this point. So that was a lot of information about one pest. Um, but to wrap this section up, you know, this is a very damaging pest and it's going to remain a damaging pest in hemp um, under outdoor production for the foreseeable future. The best option for management at this time is to remain diligent, scout as often as you can, and initiate control measures, whatever you decide to do, at the first appearance of larvae, because no matter what you do, everything works better with smaller larvae. Um, of the allowable options, the virus insecticides may offer the highest level of earworm suppression at this point. But, you know, we need more research, which is the theme for everything that I'll talk about today and any conversation you would have with me about this topic. We need more work. We need more work across more locations so that we know what's going on in different regions across the country. So that's all for corn earworm. Next target is cannabis aphid. So uh, the scientific name is Sporadon cannabis. The range, as far as I know, it's everywhere. Anywhere that you would grow hemp or cannabis, you're likely to see this insect. It's a specialist, meaning that it exclusively feeds from hemp or cannabis, um, and this can be found in indoor or outdoor crops. Likelihood of encounter, I say probable just because it's a specialist, so it, it's highly likely that you'll see it. Um, so like I've said, uh, cannabis sativa is the only plant species in which this species will feed from. It is a specialist, so it you know, planting other crops to try and distract this particular aphid won't really work here. Um, this aphid is typically light green, maybe light yellow, kind of clear in coloration. Um, it can have wings, it cannot have wings, it can be a smaller aphid, it can be a larger aphid, you name it, you might see it as cannabis aphid. Um, there is, you know, pretty good potential for parasitism of this aphid by um, parasitoid wasps, um, and more research is being done with these particular wasps to figure out what kind of target is best. So I'm going to give a shout out to Andrea Garfinkel from Oregon CBD for this photo. Um, this is a really helpful image that kind of shows a key identification characteristic of this aphid. It has these really pronounced nodules on the um, on its head capsule, which if you look at this under a microscope and you see these little horn projections, you're going to know that it's cannabis aphid that you have. Um, asexual reproduction is common for this insect, meaning that the female gives live birth to identical offspring. Um, in addition to these non-winged forms, 
uh, reproductive or winged forms can develop as well. You can kind of see these winged forms outdoors or in indoor situations where um, aphid populations are pretty dense. So unfortunately for management, females can produce several offspring per day. So populations can quickly skyrocket to high numbers um, in a very short amount of time. If you're producing outdoors and you see this insect, uh, outdoor populations are highest later in the season, kind of close to harvest. And just reiterating again that since this insect produce, reproduces primarily asexually, populations can increase very quickly. Uh, this insect can be found all throughout the plant, so that includes leaves, stems, and bud material. There, you'd see them a lot on stems and typically on the underside of leaves, like in this photo. Um, a risk with this insect is that as it moves through the plant and feeds, it excretes the substance called honeydew, which is a really sticky substance, and honeydew can lead to sooty mold formation, which is kind of the black looking stuff on the leaves in the photos. Um, in addition, as the aphid molts and grows, it sheds exoskeletons, um, and these can get caught in the sooty mold, which is just really, really gross and not pretty to look at, and it leaves you with a sticky plant, um, in addition to the, you know, the normal stickiness of hemp. Um, something that we see from aphids and other plants, if you look at the photo on the top right, you can sometimes see yellowing, leaf curling, and wilting resulting from aphid feeding. This isn't typically, at least in my experience, not what we've seen with cannabis aphid. Um, it can definitely still cause some yellowing and some slight leaf curling, but you know, the, the photo on the left, the damage from this aphid isn't as bad as what you see, a uh, damage that you see from aphids and other crops. Um, again, just showing some photos, it can um, cause this sticky coating on plants due to the honeydew. Um, and again, you can see that populations in these photos have quickly gotten out of hand. This is the really bad case of management. Um, same here, really bad situation with management. Um, just pointing out again that plants can be filled with aphids but still retain their vigor. Um, you definitely don't wanna see this. This is a, a bad lapse in judgment here where management was not taken early enough at all. Um, and the plants are just sticky and filled with um, aphids and cast skins and, and just not, not very good. Um, yet again, more cases of bad management. So if you're producing outdoors, it's really important that you get rid of any leftover plant material in the field at the end of season, just because, you know, um, we're not sure how, you know, what the cold tolerance of this insect is, but you know, material left in fields can help sustain populations between seasons. Um, additionally, it's the good thing, uh, natural enemies can aid management. Um, you typically see lady beetles feeding on this aphid quite a lot outdoors, and there are other things like assassin bugs, damsel bugs, and then um, green lace wings that can help manage populations. So as far as management strategies, I can't say enough how important it is to scout Outdoors, make sure you're removing crop material at the season in and, you know, kind of let natural enemies do their thing. They'll help you with management. Indoors, you really want to inspect any kind of plant material prior to introducing it into your operation. Make sure it's clean as you're starting. Um, you can employ natural enemies as well. If you choose to use insecticides, um, consider using things like soaps, insecticidal soaps, um, neem oil, azadiractin, or other biological products that are legal in the state where you're producing. I would suggest using pyrethrins as a last resort just because these can kill off natural enemies as well. Moving on. Oh, okay. Uh, next up is two spotted spider mite. So this is found pretty much everywhere as well. It's a generalist pest that can be um, it's primarily present in indoor environments, but it can be outdoors as well in, in certain ranges. Likelihood of encounter, it's possible. It's not always a given um, that you're going to see this one. So like I said, it's a common pest indoors, no matter what you're producing. It's less frequently encountered outdoors, but it can be common in drier or more arid climates like the Western United States. 
Um, it's big enough that you can see it with the naked eye. You don't need microscopy for it. And it is a mite, so it has eight legs. Um, Two-spotted spider mites have these needle-like piercing sucking mouth parts. So as they feed on hemp plants, they'll cause this stippling on leaves, which leaves these kind of dotted looking appearances, which is very typical of two-spotted spider mite feeding. Um, webbing is really common where populations are dense. These webs that they form are actively are actual, actually a protective measure to kind of keep them safe under the umbrella of this webbing so that they can continue reproducing and expanding their populations. Um, you can see as well um, just the kind of dirty looking appearance um, in both of these photos where there's an abundance of mites. Um, there's two videos to show you how, how it looks when their populations are really dense. Um, this is shared from a grower in California. Um, this is a pretty dense population. You can see all the little mites moving around in the video on the left. In the video on the right, you can see um, the webbing on the, this kind of grouping of plants. Again, it's, you um, definitely want to implement some type of management before it gets to this point. Um, so what are some strategies for management? Again, scouting is, is super important. Um, it's important to inspect plants prior to introducing them. Um, and anywhere that you see an outbreak, maybe try to you know, implement some form of management. Luckily, due to data on this uh, pest and other types of greenhouse production systems, we know that natural enemies work really well. Um, one of the particular ones is Phytocellus persimilis. There are definitely others. I think this is just a really common one. Um, other species of predatory mites can aid management as well. Um, minute pirate bugs are really good for management here. If you use pesticides, um, insecticidal soaps or oils will work will work really well. All right, so next is hemp russet mite. This is another specialist similar to the cannabis aphid. It only feeds from cannabis sativa crops. Um, in my experience, I've seen it indoors and outdoors. The likelihood of encounter, I say possible, um, I'll talk about this as we move through this section, but I think the most common situation here is that you get plant material or cuttings from an outside source. The, that material comes already partially infested with these mites and they're really, really difficult to manage um, once you have them in your environment. So these mites are very small. Unlike the two-spotted spider mite, um, you can't see them with the naked eye. This is also a different type of mite. Um, it's in the, I didn't note this on the last slide, but it's in a different family called Areophyte. Um, these are very, very small. They only have four legs. They use their four little legs to kind of pinch into the plant and hold themselves in place. Um, you really need microscopy, or in some cases, if you have a really strong hand lens, that might work um, to help confirm presence. But I always highly recommend microscopes or some kind of something where you can see the plant material up really close. Um, it's, you can see this in the photo on the top left. The scale here is half a millimeter, and they're even smaller than that, so for some kind of idea of scale. Um, if you're on the East Coast, it's after lunch. If you're on the West Coast, it's lunchtime or just before. Um, this is kind of what the mites can look like under the microscope, um, not zoomed in too much, but I always tell growers they look like it's like you shredded Parmesan cheese or you sprinkled something on your pasta, um, not to ruin your appetite, but hopefully that will help you remember what they, what they look like. Again, they're super tiny. These are photos of some aphids under the microscope and where I have the arrows pointed, those are all little russet mites that got caught in the aphid in the process of doing this research project. So just for scale, they're really, really small. Um, mites, prefer to infest developing buds, so developing or developed parts of the plant material. Um, their feeding can reduce the size and quality of future buds as the plant grows and develops. Um, where the mite has fed in these new and developing areas, there's usually a kind of just dirty or gray appearance where they've fed. Um, this can 
this can happen from, you know, they're feeding from the surface of the leaf. They're getting rid of some of the chlorophyll in the leaf. So it just looks gray and drab and just sickly and dirty overall. Um, as I've said, their feeding injury can lead to decreased bud density. This was from an indoor hemp facility in Virginia. They had a massive infestation of hemp russet mites. They managed to salvage the plants to an extent. I mean, this isn't a super attractive looking plant at this point, but you know, it at least there's something there, but you can see where the density of the buds are drastically decreased. It's really patchy and not super uniform. Likely other things going on here as well, but the key infestation is hemp russet mite. Um, like I've said, it can be a problem both indoors and out. Um, issues can really arise from infested transplants. Um, this was in a field setting. Um, this one plant was really under the pressure of hemp russet mites. The ones around it weren't as bad. Um, you know, also given these mites are so small, they can kind of easily disperse on wind. It just depends on the environment and what, what the weather is like, basically. Here, you know, that didn't really happen. The population stayed pretty isolated, but it's, it's worth knowing how small they are and how easily they can move if wind comes, sorry, wind comes through. Um, as I've said earlier too, with lots of mites, the plant material can look dirty or dusty. Um, it's, this is just a really dense population of hemp russet mites. The one on the right, it looks like it could be, it could have been dipped in dirt or something, you know, same for the photo on the top left. Um, but if you had a microscope and were able to zoom in, this is actually what you'd see, um, a pretty heavy abundance of hemp russet mites. So kind of gross. Um, I, I want to point this out too. I think earlier on, one of the one of the key thoughts about russet mite feeding an injury on hemp and cannabis or marijuana plants was that, you know, the most typical symptom was this leaf curling. Um, that's definitely not always the case. Some cultivars will react in this way, but not all. So a good example is the photo on the left, mites were detected. On the photo on the right, there's the curl and mites were not detected. Here again, um, mites were not detected on these plants. Um, and here, this is leaves curling down. Mites were detected here, but you know this is not always the case. So the what I'm really trying to tell you here is that leaf curling is a lot of times just kind of a genetic response to some source of stress, whether on the plant or whether it's environmental. So leaf curling is not always um, indicative of a hemp russet mite infestation. But the key is that you should, you know, really invest in a microscope if this is a crop that you're planning to produce long term because it can save you from these infestations. Um, again, scouting is really important. You know, if you're bringing material indoors, make sure you're inspecting this plant prior to introducing it into your environment. It's worth cordoning off a section as well for kind of you know, quarantining this plant material before it's introduced to the rest of um, the operation, just in case you've got, you know, some mites, even a small population could increase pretty quickly. Um, as far as other management tactics, natural enemies, we don't know of any at this point, um, or at least ones that would target this mite are not commercially produced and available. Uh, when it comes to pesticides, always check to see what the rules and regulations are where you live and where you produce your crop. But um, data that we've seen so far, um, it seems like oils and sulfur work the best. Um, I did not put the publication in this section, but I do have um, a published trial looking at hemp russet mite management. It's in the journal Arthropod Management Tests and it's open access. So if you search for it, you'll be able to find it. All right, moving on again. Uh, next up is beet leaf hopper, and I've kind of grouped other leaf hoppers in here as well. Um, this specific leaf hopper, the beet leaf hopper, is present only in the Western United States, um, but it's a big problem. So I've I've included it in this presentation. It's a generalist species. Hemp or cannabis or marijuana is not its preferred plant at all. Um, but since outdoor production has increased over the past few years, we've definitely seen a lot of injury from this insect. 
Um, your risk level, I think it's very likely that you'll encounter this um, particularly and only particularly if you're in the Western United States. Um, so there's a photo of it on the top and a photo of it here. It's a pretty nondescript looking leaf hopper. Um, if you see leaf hoppers on your plant, you should, you know, at least note that they're there. Um, these are photos that I got from Punya Nachapa. She is a professor at Colorado State University. She's done a lot of work with insect virus interactions and done a lot of work with this species in particular. And so this is a publication from her group. And these are all symptoms that resulted from um, beet leaf hopper, or I'm sorry, beet curly top virus um, in the field, which is the virus that this leaf hopper causes. So you can see things like fasciation, yellowing and hopper burn, distortion of leaves, and even leaf curl. So like I was saying with russet mite, it's not always just a symptom of russet mite. It's a greater indicator of some type of stress to the plant overall. Um, I think the key, one of the key symptoms to this virus is this distortion and kind of leaf curling. As a scientist, it's really cool and really pretty to see, but as a grower, this is not good to see at all. Um, the photo on the bottom left, you can see how this plant is just a little more yellowed overall. It's not this deep, healthy green like you want to see, and there's hopper burn on the edges of these leaves. Uh, these photos were taken by me in California. This was in California this past summer as well um, along the coast. This was, I thought, some pretty drastic symptoms of beet curly top virus. Um, again, just reiterating what this can what this can do and what type of symptoms it can cause in the plant. Um, also from along the coast this year, you know, by the end of the season, these plants were still alive and they had buds and stuff, but they just didn't look as good as the plants that didn't get this virus in the first place. Um, it's just weird you know, we're still learning about this and we know that it's causing yield loss. We just haven't been able to quantify how much yield loss it's causing just yet. So in addition to beet leaf hopper, there are all, all kinds of leaf hoppers found throughout hemp. Um, these are photos taken of specimens we collected from a survey in California over the past two years. Um, still really unsure of what they're all doing and which ones are most um, the biggest risk for us, but you know, beet leaf hopper is one you really got to watch out for. Here's what the insect looks like. Um, they're really small insects. They move really quickly. The adult is on the left. Nymph is on the right. The nymph just doesn't have wings. So it kind of scurries and walks along the leaf where the adult can just hop and fly away and get out of your way really quick. Um, these are photos from um, a friend and colleague in the Midwest. So this is not beet leaf hopper, but again, it's reiterating these symptoms that leaf hoppers can cause to plants. Um, this yellowing, distortion, and this general just hopper burn on the edge of leaves. So it's it's just a weird thing that it causes. And like I've said, it's causing yield loss. We just haven't been able to quantify it yet. So management strategies here are pretty tough. Um, in other crop systems, you know, there's been research done over years and years we know the resistant varieties or resistant cultivars in hemp and marijuana, cannabis, we don't know that at this time. Another strategy in other crops is seed treatments. Um, we are not there for hemp. We likely will not be there for many years to come. So not an option for us right now either. Um, when it comes to pesticides, this can be really challenging um, due to the, the just the general nature of this insect. You know. Like I showed you, the insect is really small. It moves, hops around, pops on and off of the plants really quickly. Um, all it takes is them landing on the plant, feeding, and they can transmit the virus very quickly. So they don't have to live on it. They don't have to sit on it for hours at a time. You know, they're there, they feed, and they're gone. Um, that's how quickly the virus can get to a plant. And once the virus is in it, it's, it's not going to change. Um, so with that said, you know, I, I don't know that pesticides are even the best option just due to the nature of the insect associated with the crop. Um, and even if insecticides were an option, um, I think the conventional products are the ones that would work better, something like a systemic insecticide, but that's not going to exist in hemp um, now or probably for the foreseeable future. So 
it's a challenge, but research is ongoing. Um, the last key species that I want to talk about is rice root aphid. This is one we've seen and learned a little bit more about over the past couple of years. Um, I think this is an everywhere pest as well. It's a generalist, meaning that it's not specifically targeting cannabis sativa crops. Um, I think it can exist in crop systems outdoors, but the primary um, concern is in indoor production. And risk level, I've put moderate. You know, this risk level that I've put on here is just my kind of general view of the problem. Um, and I've put it at moderate because if you have it, it's likely to be an issue. Um, but if you can maintain good sanitation, you know, you may not end up seeing it. This has been a challenging species to study. Just the summer 2022, I tried several times to get a colony of these started to try and do something with research. They wouldn't cooperate. So it's, and that's the um, sentiment I've heard from other colleagues across the country that it's difficult to get these established um, to try and do further research on. So as the name suggests, they're primarily found in roots, as you can see in the two photos on the left. Um, but a fairly recent paper from Whitney Cranshaw and Suzanne Wainwright Evans, um, and in conversations with Suzanne, we've learned that, you know, just because it's primarily a root aphid doesn't mean it's always in the roots. It can sometimes be seen on leaves and stems and feeding more throughout the plant. Um, I still, the primary region for concern is the roots. So here's another video from a grower. I know this, it's kind of blurry. It's moving kind of quickly, but if you focus on the, the green areas in the middle or top portion of the video, you can see um, where these aphids are concentrated along the roots of a plant. Um, so as the name suggests, they really like the roots. Here again, they are found um, in the soil area of plants. So just alone, the fact that it's a root pest uh, makes it a huge challenge. You know, scouting is always important. It's important here, but, you know, my first instinct is not always to check the roots um, if the plant looks like it's dwindling. I, and assume many others might think that it's something else um, before assuming that it could be rice root aphid. Um, as far as insecticides go, um, I think root drenches are the way to go. But again, I, you know, I'm saying this with extreme caution and I've got the second bullet point on the slide kind of emphasizing that this is highly dependent on local state, local and state regulations. And it's highly dependent on label language on the product that you're using. Um, this is likely not allowed in a lot of locations, but it's, I guess, information that we know from seeing this pest in other types of crops where insecticide use like this would be allowed. So this one's a challenge, but I think it's a point to um, help you remember that sometimes there's stuff happening um, below the soil. You know, there's things in the roots, which is not always your first instinct when you're scouting for pests. So now for the rest of the PowerPoint, I've got some just kind of occasional species that I've seen um, grouped by chewing insects, piercing, sucking insects, and then root pests. These are things that are not that big of a problem, but they're things that you'll likely see um, either indoors or outdoors. So I just wanted to share some information and draw your attention to um, whether they're a concern or not. So for the chewing group, on this slide, I've just got the photo of yellow striped armyworm. Um, there are all kinds of species of caterpillars that are going to be present in hemp and chew from leaves or sometimes stems and sometimes buds. Um, I think most typically these other species are found feeding on leaves. Um, in some certain or extreme conditions, they can be found feeding from bud material, but most likely going to be concentrated on leaves. These are things like armyworms, cutworms, and woolly bears. Um, an application of BT would help these, um, would help knock these back. You know, I didn't really recommend BT for corn earworm just because we see a lot of resistance in outdoor situations, um, but for other caterpillars, BT seems to work a little bit better. There are going to be things like grasshoppers too. Depending on your location and depending on the infestation level or the type of crop surrounding your hemp crop, um, these can be a great risk or they can be kind of a lower risk. Um, 
in extreme conditions, you know, they'll chew stems and cause plants to topple over. Um, I think mature young plants are more vulnerable to grasshoppers than um, older or mature plants, but you know, it's it's worth knowing about. Um, I think these can be an extreme concern in rangeland areas or areas where there's more open area, um, like you would typically see in the Western United States. These can be a challenge too, because any insecticide that would likely work to manage a grasshopper really well is likely not allowed in hemp. Um, and the problem with biologicals and the products that are allowed in hemp is that you know, there may not be as much of a residual or a persistent effect with that particular insecticide. Um, so it's not going to aid the problem super well. Um, there are lots of beetles. These are typically feeding from leaves. One in particular, um, the one in the middle, southern corn rootworm or cucumber beetle. In other types of crops, these can transmit bacterial infections. Not seen anything like that happening in hemp yet. So I not too worried about it right now. Um, again, they typically feed from leaf area, which loss of leaf surface area has not been a concern so far. Um, we've never seen any resulting yield loss or crop injury just from leaf feeding. We've also got flea beetles. Um, these come and go. You'll Sometimes you see them, sometimes you won't. They move really quickly like the leaf hoppers. Um, their name is flea beetles, so they can hop um, very quickly from plant to plant. The typical type of crop injury here, again, is focused in the leaves, but um, you can kind of see it on the lower portions of the um, photo on the left and then the photo on the bottom right. They cause this particular thing called shot hole damage. So it looks like, you know, if um, it's like a spray of little holes in the leaves. Um, but again, loss of leaf surface area hasn't led to any type of plant damage or yield loss that we've seen so far. Other groups are scarab beetles. Um, this is, a, I think, one of the more extreme cases of beetle feeding on a plant. This was from one of my PhD committee members. Um, just on a localized portion of the plant, they kind of skeletonized this leaf section. And even with this you know, intense leaf loss, um, the plant was fine. It recovered super well. Same situation here. This was sent from a grower in North Carolina. Um, considerable portions of the leaf surface area can be removed and nothing really happens. So, you know, it's good to be on the lookout. It's good to know that this is happening, but I, I wouldn't freak out too much if you see this happening. Um, next is piercing sucking insects. So, you know, we've got other aphids um, like potato aphid, green peach aphid, melon and melon or cotton aphid. Um, it's I think it's the similar case to cannabis aphid. They can feed, they can um, extract nutrients from the plant, but it's not really harming it like you would see in a typical type of horticultural crop. So either whether it's cannabis aphid or other aphid species, you'll see them, um, I, you know, manage them if they get to considerable numbers, but I wouldn't freak out about these um, other aphid species too much. Other groups are stink bugs. There are different, types of stink bugs or different species of stink bugs that you can see in plants. Um, also did not share the publication here, but one of my PhD research objectives was um, looking at stink bugs in hemp. And based on a study that we did, um, we caged stink bugs on buds of plants and didn't see any type of negative impact to the crop from stink bug presence or feeding. Um, so just showing photos of stink bugs in the plants, not a cause for concern in my opinion. Same for ligus bugs. Um, this one could cause some anxiety just because, you know, tarnished plant bug is um, a highly injurious, pant, injurious pest in crops like cotton. It can really um, reduce yields in cotton, but have not seen anything like that in hemp either. In my experience, um, East Coast and West Coast, um, this insect can be present in crops from planting all the way to harvest, but I've never seen any kind of impact at all from their feeding. So that's good news for now, but it's definitely something to remain on the lookout for. Another group are chinch bugs. Same story here, no negative impact. We really more often see these concentrated on um, grain or seed variety hemp. They really like feeding from seeds. 
but even there, no noticeable impact to um, seeds or seed harvest. White flies, um, these are prevalent pretty much throughout the U.S. I've seen more of them um, during my time on the West Coast, but even in very dense populations, I've not seen any kind of, you know, really negative impact to the plant. Um, the plant seems to do pretty fine with the presence of these. There is always concern that there could be risk of virus or pathogen transmission, but to date have not seen that occurring. Um, thrips, similar story here. There could be concern with these because they can transmit pathogens or viruses. Not seen that be a problem. Um, I think these can be a reason for concern, but to my knowledge and given my experience, I've not seen a crop suffer from thrips, feeding, or injury. Um, just more close photos of what they look like. Adult is on the left. Um, a more juvenile version is on the right. And then here's what um, the adults look like. They're really, really small. So this is a super zoomed in photo. Um, they have mouth parts called rasping, sucking mouth parts. Sounds really extreme. Um, they can cause this stippling appearance on leaves as well. Kind of, kind of similar to um, spider mite feeding, but <clears throat> not exactly the same. Um, another mite is the broad mite. I unfortunately haven't seen this in hemp or marijuana or cannabis too much, but um, it's it's something that can happen. I've included this photo. It's a it was a retroactive realization, but it seemed like um, this plant in an indoor growing environment may have had a little bit of broad mite damage, um, but not not a ton of bad stuff going on. I don't know a lot about this one, unfortunately, but it's worth noting that it has been reported from hemp and cannabis crops. Um, next group are root pests. Other things are fungus gnats. You know, this, um, I'm not saying that damage is exactly like that from rice, from rice root aphid, but it's at least worth having on your radar um, these usually arise from improper sanitation or kind of really wet soil plants. It's just another one to kind of think about because, you know, we don't always think to inspect the roots first thing, but there can be stuff going on in the roots. Um, another group are fire ants. So this is from a colleague in the southeast um, in Alabama. These can be a, a really big problem for outdoor crops down there. Um, you know, in addition to just the risk that they pose by being in the field to, to you as a grower or a worker walking through this field, um, this was this was kind of a surprise to learn about that they really target um, roots and stem portions of plants and can really cause damage um, in young plants. So young plants are the concern here. They'll feed from them and can cause a lot of plant loss. Um, another kind of surprise pest was termites. You know, if you recall, hemp has kind of a woody stem, so this kind of makes sense. In all the cases and situations where I've seen or heard about termite damage, there's always been some kind of dead or decaying or rotting log or tree in the presence of the field, so this is what led to termite damage in hemp. Um, another group was wireworms. This is another root pest you aren't really going to be aware that this is present um, in a field until it's too late. These um, worms exist in the soil, and once roots um, start to grow in the soil, they'll feed from the roots and can harm plants in that way. So this is a, um, a pest that you have to look for proactively in outdoor environments. Um, another is leaf miners. I've seen a lot of these um, on both coasts and you know, they, they make pretty art for you. I haven't seen any kind of negative impact other than that. Um, one of the last ones to talk about is Eurasian hemp borer. There's not a lot, um, I guess this is one of the more historically reported pests from the era of fiber hemp production in the early United, or sorry, um, in the early era of hemp production in the United States. Um, it's a borer, as the name suggests, so it chews its way into the lower portion of the stem and bores its way up through the stem. 
Um, it has this really, as a, a larva, it has this really distinct orange or pink coloration. As an adult, the moth is really small and it has this kind of face looking um, arrangement on its wings. Um, this I think is more common in the Midwest or areas where there was historical hemp production and where there still may be what we call feral hemp, um, hemp that just grows wildly. Um, this You're more likely to see it there. I haven't really seen it be a problem in Virginia or California in my experience thus far, but it, it's definitely one to know about. Um, and the last one I wanted to talk about is another type of historical pest, the European corn borer. Um, this one as well bores into the stem of crops. I was really, really kind of worried about this as a pest until I saw it firsthand in the field a few years ago. Um, it definitely bores into plants. This was a cannabinoid hemp plant where all these photos came from, but you know, it it might have harmed a little section of the plant, but it didn't knock out the whole plant entirely. So it's still one to watch for. And if you see holes on the plant or this kind of sawdust looking appearance, like in the um, bottom middle photo, it could indicate that there's some type of boring situation happening, but it's um, not, not the most common. And, you know, for European corn borer and Eurasian hemp borer, um, this is not, don't have a lot of management strategies for these. And even if we had insecticides, um, they're very difficult to, difficult to control. So that's all I have for the pest groupings, but I wanted to at least mention pesticides before we wrap up today. So I've repeated it with every pest um, throughout the presentation, but pesticides are federally regulated. Um, the EPA has direct oversight of this. Um, however, individual states have been left with the task of deciding what pesticides can be applied to hemp um, or cannabis or marijuana crops, if that's what you're working in. Um, you know, there's a lot of self-responsibility that comes here, which, which can be very challenging if you're a producer, but, you know, the biggest thing I can tell you is make sure you're reading the label thoroughly before you apply any product, um, and make sure it's feasible, um, via label language or a list put out by your state, um, for you to apply the product. It's very important. And, one other thing you could do is kind of talk to your producer or your buyer to see um, what opinions they may have as far as products that you might use or apply on the crop. Um, just, I'm based in California. I, I thought that our, uh, our language regarding pesticide use was pretty digestible, and I thought I would at least share what our situation is. Um, so this goes for cannabis or marijuana in California. Um, you know, if the active ingredients found in the product are exempt from tolerance, residue tolerance requirements and from registration. So that would be um, designated as a 25B insecticide or pesticide, um, or, you know, exempt from residue tolerance requirements and use of the product is not legally in conflict with the label, which I think is the more important, always making sure that whatever you're using is not in legal conflict with the label. And for hemp, the only extra requirement here is that, you know, the product is actively registered for use on hemp. And what that might look like, um, this is just a product I know that has hemp on the label. You know, this is the, the name of the product, the active ingredients. Here's some label language regarding what crops this product could be used in. And, you know, this is a situation where hemp is explicitly on the label. So as long as this pesticide is registered in your state and it's legal for use in your state, you can apply it to your hemp crop. Um, so I thanks for participating and for joining this talk today. Um, as you've learned, there are many species that are observed in hemp. Some of them are pests, some of them are beneficials, and some of them are just feeding for a little bit before they're moving on to the next crop. We've got some management strategies and some knowledge at this point, but you know it's important to remember that this is still a very new crop. Even though it's been legal for several years, it's still very new um, in the American landscape. And you know, as a um, representative of a university, you know we're slowly making steps to conduct more research with these things and. As we are able to conduct more research, uh, we'll learn more management strategies and we'll 
know better how to handle these situations with more time and with more experience. And the last thing I'll say is the most important cornerstone to managing pests, whether it's an insect or a mite or a pathogen or a weed, is the economic threshold. So the economic value of your crop determines every management decision. With hemp, this is challenging because the market is really unstable and it's still developing and research is ongoing. So I'm hopeful that in the years to come, we'll have economic thresholds for these pests in this crop, but it's still a work in progress. Um, so to close, you know, everything that I said, I think can be can be pretty much found in this publication from a few years ago. Um, I'm an author on this along with colleagues from Colorado, um, Tennessee, and me in Virginia. But this is kind of the first stab we took at explaining the situation, um, kind of explaining the pest complex, um, and not just pest complex, but other things that you would see in the crop. Um, so I, I still think this is a paper that's really helpful. It's with the Journal of Integrated Pest Management. It's open access. So if you find this online, you'll be able to read it. Um, I think it's helpful and it kind of reiterates what I said today. Um, another thing, Whitney Cranshaw has been um, basically an encyclopedia of knowledge on this topic. Um, everything that I've learned from my experience and my research um, can be you know, there's more information on particular pests here. So I would encourage you to check out the Colorado State um, Hemp Insect page for more information on hemp insects and mites. And then lastly, um, there's a million people to thank for help with this, but these are just some I wanted to give a shout out to. Um, Whitney, like I said, um, Suzanne Wainwright Evans, the photo on the top right, and the photo in the top middle um, is my postdoc advisor and colleague Saul Alba. Um, their, their help um, in exposing me to issues that are occurring in real time has been really, really, really helpful. So um, with that, I am done and I'm happy to um, take any questions that might have come so we can check the chat and the, the Q&A now. Yeah, it was a fantastic presentation, Katie. Oh, thank uh, you. We have several questions in the Q&A, so feel free to read them out loud. Um, okay, the, let's see. The first thing I see is research attached to entomologists like Professor Chris Carlton at LSU have claimed that predatory mites have proved successful against hemp russet mites and cultivators have reported success using species like cucumeris, but this seems to be contentious with other reports. Is there research about this to be published that is more conclusive? Um, at this time, I don't know of anything um, and I, I think I said it during the hemp russet mite section when I was talking, but what we know so far is at least the mites that are commercially produced are not really working. And that's kind of what I know right now. Um, if more information comes out, you know, I would make sure it's from a reputable source, um, like a peer reviewed publication or, um, you know, something that's been peer reviewed. So good question. Um, Next question, on average, how many eggs do the female corn earworm lay? It appeared she deposited a single let, single egg in each location. So um, she can lay a lot of eggs. I'm not sure of the exact value off the top of my head, but um, it's worth noting that she does lay eggs singly. So one at a time, um, wherever she lays them, but she can lay multiple in a night. Um, what type of application for the corn earworm insecticide? Can I use it in my drip system or foliar? That's a great question. Um, so any product that's currently labeled um, for use in hemp is going to be a foliar type of application. Um, with systemic or drip insecticides, um, I believe those are more systemic and you know, nothing like that, at least at this current point, is labeled for use in hemp. So it would be a foliar type of application. And it's worth noting as well that um, a lot of the products labeled for hemp are biological in nature. So they have a biological active ingredient or um, they're more organic production type of products, um, which kind of means that they don't have 
um, a strong residual effect. So anything that you apply is going to need to be continuously applied. You can't just apply it once and be done. Um, let's see. You say cannabis aphid only feeds on cannabis. What do you mean by feed? Dr. Punya Nachapa has shown that the cannabis aphid can spread viruses to potato through feeding. So they do feed on other plants. Perhaps they are not able to complete their life cycle on other plants. Erin, thanks. That's a really great point. Um, you're entirely correct. I get, I get used to saying things one way, and this is what I need to kind of help me remember to say them the right way. Um, yes, uh, out of Punya's lab, there is a paper showing that cannabis aphid can transmit potato virus Y to potatoes, um, so it can feed on potatoes to transmit this virus. However, you're exactly right. That's a better way to say it. Um, it's not that it exclusively feeds on cannabis crops. It's that it needs cannabis crops to complete its life cycle and develop and continue its life cycle. So good. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, does neem oil have insecticidal qualities or does it work more like a horticultural oil? Um, neem definitely has insecticidal qualities. Um, are other leaf hoppers a problem in the eastern U.S.? Um, so things we've seen so far are potato leaf hopper. That's the only one I, I know of specifically. There can be other species, um, but as far as transmitting viruses like beet curly top virus from beet leaf hopper, um, I am not sure. I just know that it's not as much of a frequent problem in the eastern United States as beet leaf hopper is to the western United States, if that makes sense. Um, Aaron, again, are there sulfur products allowed for use on hemp as an insecticide? Um, I think that is a question where it's going to depend on products allowed for use from state to state. Um, I, I don't even want to say what states may allow it because I'm not sure, but I, I believe I've seen it on some state-specific lists. Um, again, if not sulfur, then consider a type of oil product, which may also be on a state-specific list. Um, I'll reiterate again, it, anytime you apply a product or you're uncertain about its legality or potential for use in a hemp or cannabis crop, I would consult um, your county extension agent in California, your county agricultural commissioner, um, resources like that who could give you a more direct answer than I could. Um, have you evaluated till versus no-till cultivation as a way to mitigate rice root aphid inf infestation? Um, that's a good question. So I, you know, till versus no till would be more of an outdoor type of situation. Um, it can exist outdoors, but I don't think it's as big of a problem outdoors. So I'm not like, I don't know that um, this would be something to explore with right, rice root aphid at the current time um, until or unless it becomes a greater problem outdoors. Um, Aaron, again, thanks, Aaron. You're asking awesome questions. Um, with hemp being federally legal, my understanding is that pesticides are regulated federally by the EPA and not at a state level. When you talk about state differences, are you talking about high THC cannabis? Um, yes and no, I guess. Um, hemp is a federally legal crop now, um, but I... No, that's a good question. Maybe state-specific use isn't as a, as big of a deal um, anymore since it is federally legal and um, products are either going to have it on the label or not. But a lot of that is because it takes like it takes so much time to alter the language on a pesticide label, and I know that companies have to go through a lot of hoops to get hemp added. So. Maybe for that reason, states may still have some type of state-specific use list for hemp, um, but that's definitely a thing for high THC cannabis like you're asking, um, which is what I was referring to with the sulfur question earlier. So um, the ultimate conclusion I can give is that it just depends always, no matter what. Um, can you discuss incidences of microbial insecticides causing inflorescences to fail compliance testing and ways in which cultivators 
and you utilize these controls while maintaining compliance? That's a great question. Um, I have heard stories of this happening. Um, I don't, you know, I don't have a specific story. I guess I've heard, um, you know, a situation where someone has told me they know of growers that this has happened to. Um, it can definitely happen. My suggestion would be, um, you know, if you can afford it, maybe testing a small section or testing a couple buds before doing a complete harvest um, or, you know, applying it in enough time that the microbial um, presence may be reduced by the time you harvest the crop. Um, that's, that's the best advice I can give there. And the last question, can sulfur products affect pH? I do not know the answer to that. Um, Luis, I don't know if you have any ideas on that, but that's, I, I do not know. And I guess I should say, I think there's different schools of thought, whether um, sulfur or oils may do better at managing russet mites on hemp. Um, a lot of it depends on experience and who you're talking to and um, experience. So that, that's all I can offer right now. Um, but thanks for the questions. These were all really good. Erin, thanks for, for all the great questions. I hope the explanations were helpful. Yeah, thank you, Katie. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, and yeah, that was a fantastic uh, presentation, Katie, and as well as the Q&A. Uh, so everyone, please join us in two weeks, on April 5th, for our sixth webinar, focused on hemp pathogens. So yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Katie. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, I um most people have left, but someone asked another question, which was just kind of a comment saying that, yeah, it's a really good point. States can and do put more restrictive use on pesticides than the federal oversight. States like California, New York, and Florida do so regularly. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, it's not always more. Um, liberal than the federal viewpoint. Sometimes it's more strict. So good point. Okay. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.